Well, hi everyone. Um, today we're gonna talk about a very dark subject because we'll be talking about this book right uh, right here, uh, Death by uh, Todd May. Um, yeah, today we're gonna be talking about uh, about death. Death is like one of the biggest questions in philosophy and may goes through um, some of the literature about it uh, but I'd say that in all uh, uh, in all you know uh, philosophical works on the subject uh, very few strike me as elegant as this uh, as this one it's a very easy read uh, very accessible and and light it's uh, it's very short it's just uh, about 100 pages long um, and um, this is uh, this is I think uh, is the most important aspect of this book. It doesn't have the mind-bending aspect of you know most philosophical uh, most philosophical books. Like sometimes when people read philosophy, they always struggle to understand the writing because they feel it is so remote from their lives. Uh, you know, like for example, when you read uh, Kant or Hegel or Heidegger, it can come off as it can come off as something really abstract with weird concepts and words that you uh, you're never sure that you know what they're referring to it's like these philosophers are talking about things from another planet or something right but with may well everything is about our planet and everyone who reads it will automatically relate uh, relate to it and I think that's due to uh, to May's involvement with general readers. Uh, like he produced many books uh, with the, with the purpose to make philosophy accessible to the to wider uh, to white audiences. So if you want to read easy ph philosophy books, May is your guy. Plus, uh, his work is uh, featured in one of the best sitcoms of all time, The Good Place. Um, it's about a woman who died and woke up in The Good Place, huh, which is basically heaven, only to discover that there was a mix-up. Like, she's, she, she's not supposed to be there. She's supposed to go to the bad place, huh, to, to hell, but her file was mixed up with someone else's. So an innocent person is being tortured instead of her while she gets to be in, uh, in heaven. Uh, but of course, she realizes this and being the bad person that she is she tries to become a good person so that she can stay in uh, in heaven and so um in, uh, in this good place you have soulmates and hers is a moral philosophy professor so she asks him to help her become good through the different philosophical approaches to ethics and morality so it's an excellent show with a clever twist and it takes philosophy very seriously like it has mad respect for the references and source material uh, so so yeah, so that show is amazing, and you can actually see May in uh, in one of the scenes, uh, and uh, and also you can see May himself in the last episode of uh, of uh, of, uh, of the show. So he worked as a uh, as a philosophical advisor and counselor for the show, among other philosophers like uh, like Pamela Hier 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 Ni, uh, Nimi uh, or Nimai, I think that's how her, her name is pronounced. Um, but yeah, but anyway, check uh, check the show, and you can also check Hier Hiero uh, Naimi or Nimai's uh, work, and of course Maze, which we will go through uh, through right now. So the book was published in uh, 2008, and it has three parts: uh, our dealing with death, in which he uh, reviews the uh, different stages, uh, the different strategies. Sorry, humans have uh, have co have come up with when it comes to deal or cope with our mortality. The second chapter is about considering what our lives would be if uh, if we were uh, if we did not die, like uh, like if we were immortal. So it is uh, called death and immortality. And then the last chapter uh, is where May offers his own insight into how we can manage to live with uh, with death. Uh, third chapter, living with death. That's uh, that's the title. So the book is also part of the Art of Living series. It's a series of book edited by a guy named Mark Vernon, uh, in which um, every book deals with a theme of everyday uh, of everyday life. So, the books in uh, the series take, for example, uh, clothes uh, as uh, as their object of, of analysis. Another book takes on 
pets, others, uh, sexuality, sports, fame, well-being, hunger, money, illness, sex, etc. Things we all know very, uh, very well. Um, I myself only read two books from the series, May's Death and Lars uh, Svensson's work, but I advise you to go check the other books in the in the series if you can uh, if you can find them. Um, in the presentation of the series, you can read the following. From Plato to Bertrand Russell, philosophers have engaged wide audiences on matters of life and death. The Art of Living series aims to open up philosophy's riches to a wider public once again. Taking its leads from the, uh, con from the concerns of the ancient Greek philosophers, the series asks the question, how should we live? Authors draw on their personal, uh, on their own personal reflections to write philosophy that seeks to enrich, stimulate, and challenge the reader's thoughts uh, about their own life. And I would say that that's why people get into philosophy in the first place. I mean, that's that's how I got into a philosophy. It was uh, it was because I needed guidance in my life about how I ought to live. Uh, when, when people get into philosophy, they're looking for answers about, you know, the meaning of their lives. Uh, they are looking for some guidance that society fails to give them. And so when philosophers try to bring that sense of guidance and, uh, and wander back into our daily lives, uh, well, they so, so sometimes they can make it worse huh? uh, because, you know, they keep asking all of these questions to which they seems to, there, there seems to be uh, no answer to, but they can also make it more concrete so that when we experience our daily lives, we can do so with a stronger awareness and involvement in, uh, in our lives. Uh, like we all know the, the feeling, uh, everything that our society tells us to do with our lives doesn't really resonate with us. It feels that it is miss, missing something important about ourselves, about our needs, desires, aspirations. Uh, it makes everything, well, kind of dull. Uh, you know, when, uh, when people always, uh, always look at kids, how they see things differently than adults, like everything is filled with wonder, and once we grow up, it's like we don't see the things that we were, uh, that we were, that were hyp uh, hyping us uh, when uh, when we were when we were a kid. Like you see a kid jump uh, jumping in a puddle, like they seem so happy just to see the water splash everywhere. We don't have the same enthusiasm uh, anymore towards puddles when we grow up. Uh, we just avoid them because we don't want our clothes to uh, to get wet or stained or or whatever. So uh, as uh, as you grow up, you kind of feel that like that something is wrong. That looking at the puddle is ju as just some some water to avoid or to be indifferent to it kind of feels wrong. Uh, like something is missing. Um, well, this is why people would go to philosophy, because it literally makes you see the puddle differently. It puts back the wonder into, into the puddle and the water splashing as you jump in it with, uh, with your boots, you know, just like you were, you were a kid. And so, so as we said, philosopher can make it, uh, make it worse sometimes. They can turn the puddle into an abstraction that is so removed from our experience that uh, avoiding the puddle altogether feels more familiar with the puddle. But again, they can also make the puddle exhibit sublime features. You know, so that's what is good about this series of books. Like the authors take something of the ordinary, uh, of the ordinary, and uh, and I like pay attention to that. You know, you can find something that you forgot or you missed, something wonderful. And so philosophy tells us how to lead good lives, or at least it tries to do so, by directing our attention to uh, the elements of our lives that we tend to overlook. Uh, and so I think uh, I think that's cool. Uh, we're doing philosophy about the things that matter directly to our lives, and so philosophy is primarily uh, primarily concerned with that question: how should we uh, how should we live? But we should be careful with this uh, because sometimes authors get trapped, as I said, in abstractions that they seem to forget this initial question. Uh, May himself is aware of this and it can uh, even occur when, uh, when talking about things that uh, that are directly involved with our lives. Huh? In the case of death, which is something that we all deal with, right? Uh, May says that sometimes here too philosophers can get trapped in abstractions. Quote, the term abstract here, uh, by the term abstract here, I don't mean difficult or complicated, I mean instead abstracted from the sp uh, specifics of people's lives. So it is important to keep in mind that, you know, 
sometimes when philosophers take on subjects that uh, that are involved in our daily uh, lives they can run the risk of turning them into abstractions that are further removed from our daily uh, daily experience and so the fact that may starts starts his book by an account of a near-death experience uh, that he uh, that he went through, uh, it, it, it kind of plays on the desire uh, to keep the subject accessible and concrete to uh, to others. Like he starts with a personal experience. Uh, he was on a plane that almost crashed into the Empire State uh, Building, and the whole philosophy on death that he describes in uh, in this short book is directly related to that experience. He even says that um, uh, it is because of that experience that he came to uh, to the reflection uh, that that he's uh, that he's writing in the, in this book. Quote: It uh, the experience gave me the gave me a chance to reflect on my life in a way uh, and with an urgency that I would probably not otherwise have done. And so the reflection he got from that experience is something uh, precious, which he is glad that he that he had uh, his near death experience showed him that being mortal is actually a good thing and this is what the book is about it wants us to think of our uh, about our mor mortality as a good thing and so uh, what it did was offer him the following reflection I realized something that was that has never left me I realized that I had not regretted my life I also knew at that moment that I would not have traded this life I had lived for another one. And so we we often don't think of death as something good. We, uh, we actually want to avoid it or avoid thinking about it. But May is like, no, if you think about it, you'll see that being mortal is one of the best things that can happen to you. Uh, because I mean, if, if we were uh, if we were mortal uh, if we were immortal sorry we would lose more than we uh, than we gain and the reflection he had is itself a proof of this because it's a great reflection uh, one that makes his uh, his existence meaningful and he says that if i was immortal this reflection wouldn't occur to me Quote, it might also seem that the fact of death, the fact that I am mortal, turned out to be a good thing on that day. After all, if I were immortal, I would neither have had a chance to reflect on my life, nor known what it meant to me to have lived this particular life. And that is because if you were immortal, uh, whatever mistake or joy you'll experience in your life, it wouldn't have any meaningful impact on your existence. You will have all the time in the world to correct your mistakes and any joy you will lose its, uh, its luster because you'll, you'll know they, um, you know they uh, like moments of joy uh, have nothing special since you're bound to relieve them again and again and again eternally. And then of course that reflection will um, will later make him live the rest of his life in accordance with that reflection or get to relieve uh, similar experiences in the same way. So in other words, reflecting upon death uh, made me appreciate my life even more. Like that's, that's basically it. So throughout the book you can actually see that at no point the thread between that experience, the near-death experience, and the content of the book is uh, uh, is severed you know at no point the that relationship is severed you read and you're like yes i can see how from that experience he can elaborate such philosophy or yes i can see how from that philosophy he experiences that event in the way that he describes it so there is some consistency between his experience and his philosophy and i would argue that's what's uh, what is often missing in uh, our lives. Uh, the sense that there is a consistency between our life and some philosophy that makes our life meaningful uh, or valuable in some way. And this is uh, what um, what these books are about and the books in the series. He uh, may and you know the, the, the 
the other books. They want us to look at the things that matter in our existence in a similar uh, in a similar way uh, that may reflect it upon his experience with uh, with death to make our experiences meaningful uh, and so having come to terms with uh, with that fact and seen it for the beauty that uh, that it is on uh, the fact that we that we die he wouldn't risk trading his life for another in which he may or may not get the chance to uh, to arrive at this uh, at this insight you know um, but of course there is uh, there is more than this you know of course like like uh, that's not just it uh, this is not case closed like he thought about death and then boom my life is awesome like uh, if i if i think about clothes in a philosophical way i'm uh, i'm going to be like yeah i don't i don't regret my i don't regret my life uh, my life either um no it, it, it doesn't really work like that uh, may has actually good reasons to think that one thinking about his death made his life meaningful and we have to go through uh, to go through you know those, uh, those those reasons before we can you know celebrate and second we have to address a few problems with the idea uh, that with death in particular De uh, life becomes uh, meaningful. So the fact that we die is great because it allows us to have great reflections like May did in the sense of being uh, meaningful. Um, that, you know, uh, that doesn't mean that we are actually understanding his insight. Uh, on the contrary, May tells us that we can't, we cannot apprehend, apprehend how death makes our life meaningful if we don't look at how it makes it meaningless. Uh, and this tension within death starts with how uh, May defines death and why this definition makes death very different from the other themes of everyday, of everyday life. You know, that definition is that death is the most important fact about human, uh, about human beings. Now, the reason uh, why I want to... Uh, why I, uh, I wanted to review this book instead of any other books in the series uh, isn't because I... I know only two, or because, uh, um, uh, or because you know, death is uh, uh, is uh, is something that is that is uh, that is that is quite uh, important. Uh, but it is actually for another reason, which is that uh, among all the themes of the series, the most important of them is uh, is May's book. It's death. Because whereas those uh, other subjects are important and we should consider them from a philosophical point of view, death, uh, as, May, uh, as May says, um, the fact that we die is the most important fact about us. There is nothing that has more weight in our lives. Uh, by this, he doesn't deny that there are other facts about us than uh, the one that we're going to die. He, and he doesn't downplay the importance of other facts in our lives. Um, other facts about us is that, you know, we love, we form friendships, we, uh, we work, we start projects, we go through intense emotions, etc. All of them are important uh, and have, you know, important role uh, as they make life meaningful. However, none of them bear uh, such uh, such weight on our lives like the fact that we are mortal. The fact that we die is the most important one because it is the end of every other fact about us. It is the end of our friendships, our projects, uh, every one of our involvements in the world. Although death is not the only important fact about us, it has the capacity in a way no other aspect of us does to absorb every other fact to bring every other aspect of our lives under its sway. And so in this sense, death is the most important fact about us because it engulfs all other facts within it with its ability to, uh, to put a stop or to negate all other facts about us. Some, uh, some may object to this and argue that the fact that, the, that they die isn't the most important fact about them. Surely there are things in life that matter more than one's mortality or have more power than that fact. May gives the example of love as something that people can use as a counter example. When someone loves another person, uh, like they love them so much that the beloved becomes the center of their life, huh? which by the way, uh, don't don't do that. Uh, don't <laughs> don't make the don't don't make your entire life about just one person or even all of the important things in your life about just one person. You just make the both of you miserable. Uh, but for the sake of argument, let's say that you did. Um, 
so you just want them to be uh, to be with you you just want to be with them at all time um, may says that even if you go to extreme lengths to make this work you you would still have other things about you that are not about your love uh, or depend on uh, on <clears throat> On your love. Uh, that, however, isn't the case with, with death. In, uh, in death, everything disappears. There won't be a single fact that can survive death or, uh, or a fact that is not about your mortality. As he says, nothing escapes it. It encompasses, uh, it, it encompasses uh, us with, uh, without reminder, uh, without remainder, and not only does it encompass us, uh, bringing everything about us within its vortex, uh, but it uh, then negates everything it encompasses. So if love makes you see the world differently, the world is still out there to be experienced either under the lenses of love or through other facts about your life you know like you um, you you like to take your dog out on a hike and that makes you enjoy being outside in nature under the blue sky or whatever but with death death makes the world disappear along with you uh, so it's like the same thing with, with pain or loss, you know, it's another objection uh, that May thinks about is when people say that uh, the loss of someone's child, for example, can be more important than one's own death. Uh, it can matter to me that I, that I lost my child uh, more, than I'm, uh, more than I am going to, uh, to die. But May doesn't think, uh, doesn't think so because even that pain is going to be negated after you die. And more importantly here, May refers to another realization that he had when he was on that plane. He says, I figured that I was going to die. Uh, there was no we for me at that moment. So the first thing <clears throat> is that I am alone in the time of my death. Like no one can die my death or share my death. Uh, that makes my own death more important to me than that of someone else's, even that, uh, even if that's, uh, that is my, my own child. And so the death of someone else can play a big role in shaping my life, but as my life is, well, my life, whatever ends it is more important than what ends that of someone else's. And therefore, my own death brings, uh, brings about the end of experiencing the death of someone else, you know? Quote, as the philosopher Martin Heidegger reminds us, the salient fact about death is that it is for each of us my own death. One's own death cannot be understood by coming to terms with someone else's death. The silencing of one's experience, including the experience of the silencing of another's experience, remains intimately one's, uh, one's own in a way that cannot be understood by analogy with anyone or anything else. So, my death, since it is the, uh, the thing that can, uh, that can never be shared with anyone, is indeed the thing that is, uh, the, that is the most about me. It is the most accurate window towards self-knowledge and towards being with a capital B. So, it's no wonder that in order to lead a good life, the topic of death cannot be overlooked. Uh, I mean, philosophers themselves, from the beginning of philosophy, took the concept of death as the most pre preoccupying topic in philosophy. As May reminds us, for many ancient philosophers, the fact of death as a central element of human being needs to be grappled with if one is to live a worthy life. So, we can look at philosophy as an attempt to come to terms with our mortality, with the fact that we uh, eventually die, and this fact is so entrenched in us that it cannot be distinguished from uh, the nature of our being, unlike other facts about us. So, in other words, to understand the being, the, the essence of, uh, of, be, uh, of being a human, one cannot overlook the central question that is of death. And so May is right in redirecting our attention to Martin Heidegger, whose magnum opus, Being in Time, opens with what Heidegger consists the most fundamental question in philosophy, that is, the question of being. And so humans are constantly looking for self-knowledge, to know what they are, and the way to shed light on the mystery of being is through death. So the, uh, the one thing that we can all agree about 
uh, agree about our being, a fact that overrides all other, all other facts in terms of its implication of self-knowledge, is that we die. And so from here, Heidegger builds a whole theory about the role that death plays in revealing a being to humans. Quote, Heidegger's early magnum opus on what he calls the question of being or the meaning of being, in the course of asking this question, he seeks to, uh, to know the, the being of the, of the one who asks the question of being, that is to say, who we are. Heidegger opens the second division of being in time with a reflection on what it is for humans to, uh, on for, for human beings to be mortal. So, therefore, if it is death that makes us aware of what we are, then it is death that allows us a, uh, a frame in which we can make sense of the contents of our lives. We can only understand the meaning of our lives through our mortality. So even if there, uh, there are tragic events that can have a decisive influence on our lives, uh, they don't have as much power as death has over it. So, powerful events may play a role in making our lives either meaningful or meaningless. A strong love and relationship can make our life worthwhile, while the death of a child can make it feel insignificant. But the attitude we have towards such events is determined by our mortality. So, death plays the role of allowing us to experience those events in the ways that we do. And so, for May, there are basically two questions regarding death. The first question is, what makes a life meaningful or worthwhile, or on the contrary, saps life of meaning? The second question is, what is the most important fact about a life, the one that structures it uh, more than any other? The importance of traumatic events lie in the, lies in their, in their role in addressing the first question. The importance of death has to do with the second. So, death plays some sort of meta role. Uh, which has nothing much to do with the content of our lives, or as May calls one's personal trajectory, as he puts it, there are projects, relationships, and events that are uh, the what's of every uh, life. Death is one of those what's, but its operation is as a how. When it becomes a what, when it, uh, when it happens, there are no more hows to, our, to a life. But before it happens, it operates on life as a how the most important how of which a human life is composed. So how a parent will react to the death of their own child, which is a content of the parent's life, is going to be determined by the fact that the parent is mortal. So the parent looks at the death of his child from the perspective of a mortal being who is also aware of his mortality. So. Even more importantly, the perspective of a human uh, mortal being, because as May says, death is the most important fact about us because we are human. Human beings seem to be different from other mortal uh, beings in the sense that they have a higher level of awareness of their own death. Uh, maybe if we were, we were unaware of death, then it won't be uh, the most important fact about us, but we are aware of it. Okay, and we wouldn't, uh, it wouldn't make sense to say that we can be unaware of it because then we won't be human beings anymore. You know, a human being who is not aware of his mortality is not a human being according to, uh, to May. Some may object saying that, uh, that we'd be just doing, doing the same stuff we're doing but just without a, sp a certain knowledge, the fact that we die. But May says first that's incoherent because remember that here we're talking about uh, about not knowing a fact. We still die, but we just either don't know it or know it only when it happens to us. So you're going to need to explain how people are disappearing from our lives without, uh, without you know, using death as an explanation, right? I mean, if we, if we are just mortal, but we don't know that we are mortal, well, how are we going to explain that people are disappearing around us without using uh, death as an explanation or something that, that is quite relatable to, uh, to death. And if we can't figure out why, then it means that we definitely regress to a lesser cognitive state, which is, you know, certainly going to, uh, to take away much of our intellectual abilities. If you cannot understand why people are disappearing uh, around us, then it means that we are, you know, that we're dumb. <laughs> 
And so as May puts it, since to be a human is to be aware of death, we could hope to revert to a less conscious, less aware status, becoming something other than a human. Few of those uh, who have thought about death have embraced this possibility. This is probably because it would be intolerable to most of us to be something other than a human being. Most of us think of this uh, something other as something less. So in other words, May asks, you think that without that knowledge our lives would be any different? Or at least won't be different to the point that you know the, the beings we're looking at can't be considered human, be uh, human beings anymore? Well, the answer is no. For May, the fact that we die is like the element in a story that once it is removed, nothing of the story can make sense. For him, everything that we do is haunted by that knowledge, and it's a knowledge that we cannot get rid of as human beings, that we will die and we don't know, uh, we don't know when. And that is what makes us human beings. What we human beings have in common is a death whose inevitability inevitability is coupled with uncertainty, a death that will end our experience and can do so at any time. So being aware of our mortality means that whatever fact we consider important about us, we know that sooner or later that fact will eventually vanish as soon as we vanish too. That knowledge certainly plays a role in our lives because we are creatures that make projects. We engage ourselves and commit to, uh, to things, to work, to relationships, to hobbies, to goals, etc. And so we think about our past and future and, you know, envision possible experiences that we want to experience uh, in the future or make some experiences of the present last through time. So knowing that we will die at an unknown moment, knowing that those projects and experiences will end, must be the most important fact about us and must be the, the thing that structures our life. Uh, he says that awareness structures the way we go about our lives, even perhaps especially when we, when we act as though we were never going to die. And so for May, knowing that we are going to die leads us, uh, leads us to, you know, to, 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 to lead lives structured around that fact. So whatever approach we will adopt regarding the, the other themes of, uh, of, the, uh, of, the, of the book series, whatever philosophy of clothes, money, work, science, pets or sex we have and live by, ultimately all of these depend on the fact that we are mortal. So whatever approach we take in whatever subject, it must be framed within the structure of one's life and that structure is giving or made possible through death. So this is related to what we said earlier, that he is glad that he nearly died because it made him realize how great his life is. He had that insight, uh, insightful reflection uh, that, as we said, is about the fact that determined the structure of, of his life. As he himself says, death has two sides and we, we're barely mentioning only one. Uh, and the one that we can, agree, uh, we can agree on is positive. But that positive side gives death, uh, I mean, that positive side, uh, death gives us meaning, like that's the positive one, can only be embraced and experienced if we also embrace the negative side of death, that death makes our lives meaningless. So yes, so death is like a two-edged sword. It makes our life both meaningful and meaningless. And this is what we have to wrestle with. So let's see how May puts it. But there is another side to that coin. Uh, I, might have, I might have died. Planes, as we have learned, do crash into buildings. And if I had died, that is to say, if I had not been immortal, I would, have, uh, I would not have seen my wife or my children again. I would not have felt the righteous uh, lassitude that comes with a hard workout or the fascination of a new idea gar uh, garnered from a book of philosophy. Those joys which meant so much, which gave me the life I realized I did not regret, uh, regret would be over. And so, in a way, this is the issue with death. Yes, it gave May that great joy of having a great reflection, it gave him the ability to cherish his wife and kids, but death also takes away the meaning of those experiences by ending them for good, by putting a stop to them. 
So it's like when you ask the universe, why did you create me so that I can experience all of these wonderful things if you are going to take it away from me? What is the meaning or the significance of experiencing that so-called great insight or reflection if I'm going to die, right? All the things that I value, uh, love, my work, my friendships, uh, everything, none of those things, no matter how perfect they can be, none of them will beat death. So he recounts a memory of him teaching a seminar about death and he asked his students to write on a, uh, on a piece of paper the most important things in their lives. Then he took the papers and he tore them into, uh, into pieces. And he, and he was like, that's what death does to those things, to those important facts about your life. And that, in his words, that is what makes death the most important fact about us, its ability to negate every other element of our lives. And so that's kind of the tragedy of death. Like it gives us quite a disturbing deal uh, that in, uh, uh, in order for us to get to the opportunity to experience uh, the best things in the world, we have to be mortal, which makes those experiences meaningless. Death is tragic, arbitrary and meaningless. At the same time, it can, because of the particular way it is tragic, arbitra arbitrary and meaningless, open up, uh, open out on a, uh, onto a fullness of life that would not exist without it. And so, this is the main problem with death. Uh, on the one hand, it offers meaning, on the other, it takes it away. And therefore, it is important to learn how to deal with death since it is the most important fact about us, and that's what May goes, uh, goes through in the first chapter of his book, What is Death? But before we look for the ways we can deal with death, we need to understand what death is. And May's first chapter has a long section to, uh, to answer that question, what is death? He starts by outlining uh, four major themes uh, we have to keep in mind when trying to define death. First, death is the end of us and of our experience. Secondly, that end is not an, accomplish an accomplishment or a goal, it is simply stoppage. Thirdly, death is at once inevitable and uncertain. We are certain to die, but we don't know when. So death does not only lie at the end of our lives, but in, uh, but in fact, pervades them. And finally, these three characteristics make us wonder whether there is any meaning, uh, meaning to our lives. So in short, death is our end and our experience. It offers no closure. Things just stop. We can neither escape it uh, nor know when it hits. And this makes us wonder if our life ha lives can have any meaning. So as May comments, these four themes of death make death quite the, ch quite the challenge for us because we're talking about a state of being in which we simply cease to exist, like all together. And that for May isn't just threatening, but it's incomprehensible. It is indeed difficult to conceive that, we, uh, that we're headed towards a state that is, you know, the most important fact about us, about our being, so it would be a state with which we would, would be familiar, one uh, that we can comprehend and make sense of, uh, since it is the most important fact about us, but it is actually all the opposite of that. Um, he says, it seems Sorry, it seems to resist thought. It is a wall uh, my mind runs up against without being able to penetrate or find its way around. It confronts me not as a threat to my being, but as an incomprehensibility that nevertheless is who I am to become. So this is like, you know, uh, we're kind of like Oedipus in that regard. Like Oedipus is known for his great intellect and throughout his life that intellect allowed him to survive and get, you know, and get, get kind of to, uh, to the top. His intellect was his tool of making sense of his life and existence. Yet when he used his intellect to look for who is responsible for, uh, for a crime that, that brought that brought the plague on, uh, on, his, on his kingdom of Thebes, he discovers that he is the criminal by killing his dad and marrying his mom. And so Oedipus brought the plague. 
So the same intellect that was mapping his existence, keeping, you know, the threads between the events of his life, you know, uh, to, uh, together, is also what shattered it. And Oedipus is now thrown into the absurdity of the world and being unable to bear it, he pulls his eyes out. And so death is kind of like that, like we are fated to become something that doesn't make sense to us, that we cannot understand because the very thing that allowed that understanding, the thing that structured our lives, is also the thing that undoes it. And so in the case of death, what is incomprehensible is non-existence. We won't be experiencing or comprehending anything once we die because we won't be, because we won't be here you know, or there, or whatever. And so some philosophers have actually found some comfort in this realization. May mentions the Greek philosopher Epicurus, for example, and his famous saying, death is nothing to us, for what has been dissolved has no uh, sense uh, experience, and what has no sense experience is nothing to us. So to understand what he meant by this, we should take a moment to understand Epicurus's moral philosophy. For him, everything in life is a matter of pain and pleasure. A meaningful life for Epicurus is a pleasurable life, whereas a life of suffering is a meaningless one. This doesn't mean that the point of life is to indulge in all kinds of extreme pleasures. On the contrary, those pleasures for Epicurus are bound to turn into suffering at one point, a point that we reach sooner, uh, sooner than we thought. Um, like, you know, getting wasted or high all the time will soon turn into unbearable suffering from which there is no escape uh, than stronger alcohol or stronger drugs. So that is not what Epicurus has in mind when he talks about pleasure. He urged his followers to control their urges and desires, not by, quote, elim uh, eliminating desire. One should seek only simple pleasures. A nourishing meal, a place to sleep, uh, friendship and camaraderie, these are the stuff of a good life. When one realizes that nothing more is needed than this, then one would arrive at peace and, for the most part, eliminate pain. And he didn't even think that the goal is to seek pleasure, but more like to avoid pain. Like if you had a life without pain or without suffering, even if you didn't get to enjoy that much of it, your life is still considered a good life for Epicurus. But because he sees life as a matter of pleasure and pain, he also concludes that all of life is a matter of experience. Pain and pleasure are literally experiences. They happen as you experience them. And remember that the main focus of Epicurus is the absence of pain rather than the presence of pleasure uh, that matters more. So what happens after we die? Well, most people are afraid of death. They don't want to confront it. They live their lives trying to escape the thought that they're mortal. But Epicurus argues that's foolish because that's the sign of a troubled life. You know, fear is painful, and Epicurus is about getting rid of pain. So if the fear of death makes me try to avoid it, and that is painful, Epicurus argues that we should do the opposite. We shouldn't try to avoid death and find a way not to be afraid of it. Quote, when, when it comes to death, he tells us, all men live in a city without walls. So in other words, you cannot avoid death because there are no walls to protect you from it. So what do you do? How can we conquer this fear of death? How then can we confront death without succumbing to the fear it inspires in us by recognizing that death is nothing to us? When we die, we are no longer. And so that's Epicurus' answer to how to confront death is in death itself. He says that we are afraid of something in which we don't exist. We can never be in death because the point of death is that we don't exist anymore. It's like you're afraid of the ocean while you'll spend all your life in the desert, you know? So you can't drown in, uh, in water if all that is surrounding you is sand. So Epicurus sees the fact that when we die, we don't exist anymore as a source of consolation. Since death means that we uh, no longer experience anything due to the fact that we no longer exist, then that's the best example of a situation that would qualify as absence of pain. Quote, Epicurus finds consolation precisely in the fact that we don't survive our death. 
For him, it is our utter elimination that va that uh, vitiates death as a source of pain. There can be no pain if there is no body there to experience it. Epicurus's core thought is that to be dead is to be without experience, and to be without experience is to be without suffering. So that's what he meant uh, uh, when uh, when he says that when uh, when we are death is not, and when death is we are not. So is this a checkmate? Checkmate to death? Well, not necessarily. As May points, there is a problem with Epicurus's view on death. One of the issues is that uh, is what May calls a switch in perspective. That is, he is switching. He is Epicurus. Epicurus is switching uh, switching perspectives on death from a living be a being who fears death to a dead being without experience of fear or anything else. In other words, Epicurus is like telling us to look at death from the perspective of someone who is already dead. Like, look at that corpse. Does it seem to display any signs of pain or pleasure? Does it display signs of experiencing things? So, from a neurological point of view, we only see an absence of activities in the brain, so we can confidently say that in that state you don't experience anything indeed. But even if that's true on an intellectual level, we can still say, so what? Epicurus's views cannot affect me because they're about someone who is already dead. Someone who is not me, like radically not me. I can never put myself in the shoes of someone who is dead. I can never see things from the point of view of the dead or that of death. And even Epicurus's argument is kind of self-defeating because we can say, as long as we are dead, we are not. You know? So as long as I am not dead, I have no reasons or, uh, or no way to switch my perspective from me as a living being to a non-me, to a me that is dead, that is inexistent. You know? So in other words, I can say that as an as a human being that is alive, being afraid of death is what makes me a human being that is alive. So when death comes, I'll stop worrying about it, but until then, I'ma keep shitting my pants because that's what an alive human being does. And it is impossible to make me switch my perspective to adopt the one uh, of a me that literally doesn't exist. To quote May, the question is whether we can reasonably make this uh, switch of perspectives. Can we step outside the perspective of our own lives enough to see things from the perspective of death? Or better, is the fact that we are nothing in death enough to, uh, enough to tear us from our involvements in and with life? Is death's being the end of our experience a way to relieve us from its threatening character, or does it instead heighten the threat to those involvements? So for May, the answer is, well, no. Knowing that there is nothing after I die isn't enough to make me detached from my involvement's projects trajectory in life. As a matter of fact, the fact that I know that in my death there is nothing to be experienced can be even more troubling for me because, well, I don't necessarily share the views of Epicurus about, um, about the, the point of life. Huh? Remember that Epicurus's view uh, Views, he views life as a matter of pain and pleasure, and if life has indeed, uh, if life was indeed only about those, then yeah, Epicurus's view on death would uh, would work. Problem is, for many of us, we uh, we won't be satisfied with only those two as a criteria uh, for our life's values. Uh, the things that matter the most to us can have such meaning that they that they come about. Uh, way more than just you know pleasure and and pain. No, it's 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 way more than that. As May says, isn't Epicurus's view just too reductive? Don't our lives involve engagements that are meaningful beyond their being sources of pleasure and pain? In fact, don't we often take on projects that involve pain in order to accomplish things whose significance is not merely a matter of providing pleasure? For me, yes, we often take on pleasures that matter not because they're a source of pleasure. Sometimes we take on projects that require a lot of pain, knowing that the pleasure we'll get from them is nothing 
compared to the sacrifices we put in. Sometimes you go out of your way to do something good for others. Whatever pleasure you'll get at, at the end, it won't be worth the trouble. But you can still do it and do it gladly because the action is meaningful. I mean, you kind of have to admit that in order to live in good societies, people would need to do things without necessarily providing them with pleasure or shielding uh, them from, uh, from pain. And therefore, this is where the Epicurean model meets its limits. For it to work, it must make everything about our lives a matter of pain and pleasure instead of meaningfulness or meaninglessness. The problem is, we're more concerned with having a meaningful life than one without pain. We're more concerned with our engagements than with whether that engagement is painful or pleasurable. To quote May, what characterizes a human life are engagements. A human life is largely a series of involvements with others, with one's studies or one's job, with one's activities or one's hobbies. There is pleasure and pain associated with those engagements, but the engagement themselves are about more than pleasure and pain. Okay, So they're, they're more because the meaningfulness we get from them cannot be assessed on a measurable scale. You cannot measure how much pleasure is there in raising a child, or becoming good at sports, or being involved in charity, or in a political campaign, etc. They are assessed in terms of their meaningfulness, an assessment that resists measure. So a proof of this is that even if you are an Epicurean, you probably still feel sad when a child dies because that child didn't do much of his life. I mean, from the Epicurean point of view, a child who dies is a good thing because they didn't have to experience pain at all. Yet, we know that an absence of pain isn't the peak of life. So, even though, yes, the kid didn't suffer much, we still hold that what, uh, what would have made the kid's life meaningful is to have lived all kinds of projects. As, uh, as May says, there is a particular tragedy to the death of young people, in part because they have not had the chance to, uh, to involve themselves in or see through uh, very many projects. Most of their projects have been little more than dreams. That is what we mean when we say they haven't had a chance to live. Hence, when we, uh, hence we see, of it, uh, we see, <laughs> sorry, we see the problem with this view of death. Even though, uh, it can, uh, even though it can reply with, you're just displacing, uh, displacing the problem. Uh, all we have to do is just you know, replace pain and pleasure by meaningless and meaningful, and we arrive at the same conclusions. Uh, your fear of missing on those engagements will be gone with death. So, quote, even if human life has to do with engagements, nevertheless, in death, those engagements are gone. There is nothing to miss about them, since there is nobody there to, be, uh, to, do, uh, to do the missing. But this objection uh, has the same problem when it comes to the switching of perspective. It wants us, human beings, who can only consider things in terms of their meaningfulness, to consider things from the point of view of someone who cannot experience meaningfulness, which is impossible. So, in other words, we don't have an on and off switch regarding life and death and experience. Like, if you're having troubles about the fear of death, turn the switch off and that's it. Uh, no more fear. Uh, that's, that's, uh, that's, not, <laughs> that's not going to work. So, although Epicurus may solve the first theme of death, he doesn't solve the second, the third, and the fourth. The second one is, death is not an accomplishment, it is not a goal, it is nothing more than stoppage of our lives. So the question of whether something is meaningful or not has, uh, has to do with its completion. All right? If you are painting, for example, the painting becomes meaningful only if it is completed. Here, completion means different things, and finishing the painting is just one of them. Someone cannot finish the painting, but the painting is meaningful because as they were painting it, they experienced some, some things that make the process of the painting more meaningful than the end product. But that too is completion, because 
that meaningfulness is something like closure. Okay, a painting can have closure without being finished. Uh, sometimes not finishing a painting can feel more meaningful than finishing it. And an unfinished painting can be more finished than a finished one in that case. Or you can think of a novel, for example, like May suggests. For a novel or a play to be satisfying, it does not have to be enjoyable. Rather, the end of a novel allows us to reflect back on its meaning. The end of any work of art is important. It is in light of this end that we consider what has happened before. In this sense, the end of a novel or a play or a movie or a poem brings the work to wholeness. It completes it rather than just ending it. And so this is what we mean by completion, is that when you look back at your life, just like a novel as you reach the ending, you're like, yeah, that makes sense. There's nothing to add, there's nothing to, to retrieve, uh, it's, it's perfect the way it is. So you can say that this is what May himself was describing when he said that he is not regretting his life, but that's not, uh, that's not, that, that's, that's not what he meant. Okay, when he said that he doesn't regret his life, he's not saying that his life was complete. May doesn't see that feeling of not regretting his life in the light described here, like his life was uh, at the point in which it was complete, when the plane was about to hit the Empire State Building. The view presented here is like an example from Heidegger, uh, from an apple that is, that is ripe. Okay, like Heidegger has this example. He says that once an apple is ripe and it is ready to be picked, we, can, we, we say that it is complete, it got closure, it reaches its purpose or whatever. Some people can see death as something like that, uh, like death picks you up as you have reached your completion, in this sense dying while your projects uh, aren't finished, when you don't have any closure on the things uh, we were involved with, uh, is what matters to you more than not experiencing the pain of death. So we want to live lives to be meaningful before death picks us up, and the model of Epicurus based on just pain and pleasure to determine the meaninglessness of our the meaningfulness of our lives, well, doesn't satisfy us. But unfortunately, as, uh, as May says, this is not how things work with death. Death is not like this. It is not the fullness of expression of life. It does not, it does not bring a life to what it uh, most characteristically is. If anything, death is the opposite. Rather than experiencing a life, it obliterates it. Expressing, sorry, expressing a life, it obliterates it, it eliminates rather than fulfill, fulfilling uh, a life's trajectory, trajectory. So in other words, death offers no closure. It does not complete anything, it doesn't, doesn't finish, it doesn't ripen our lives, lives or projects, it just severs them, cuts them short and adds nothing to them or confers no meaning to our projects or relationships or whatever it is that we hold dear. Even if we can say that technically the projects are still going after our death, like uh, someone finishes the novel that we started, uh, or our relationship survives in the memories of our partner who is still, uh, who is still around, uh, May argues that first the novel that someone finishes for you isn't your novel anymore, but it's theirs. It is now part of their own life and is therefore about them, not about you. And it's the same thing with the partner. It's not that the relationship survives, but rather, quote, the effects of the person and the relationship lingers in the survivors. What each of us carries around from the, pers from the person who has died is not actually a piece of them, but an afterglow, sometimes a per permanent, one, uh, permanent one from their having uh, lived among us. The intimacy, like the effects, is instead a, short, a sort of shadow that both follows me and emanates from me without having an existence independent of me. And so it's the same thing when you are in a relationship with someone who is about to die. You know when uh, your spouse is, termin uh, is uh, terminally sick and so you try to have the best moments together before they pass away. That can be seen as, as an example in which you're trying to end the novel on a meaningful note. However, and uh, let's try to be sensitive here, uh, this by no means reduces the importance of that experience if you went through or something like that, uh, and no one is saying that your last moments with the person that you love before their death are, uh, are not meaningful, 
they are meaningful the issue is that they are not meaningful because they are like the end of the relationship okay they are meaningful in their own right okay it's not the completion of the relationship that makes those moments meaningful it's not like without them the relationship won't have any meaning or that the relationship needs to have a novel uh, a novel like ending to be to be a meaningful relationship as may says this does not amount to bringing the relationship to completion it is instead a substitute for a, for a relationship that is about to end what is characteristic of a relationship like this does not lie in any wholeness it might achieve at the end. It lies in the ongoing relationship itself. It does not have an end that brings its meaning to the fore. It is its own meaning. So the challenge is to argue for what makes them meaningful if it's not completion. You know, what, what makes our projects meaningful if it's not their completion? So this is not to say that finishing a project isn't in itself meaningful. When I finish a book, for example, I get a sense of completion and a sense that my efforts were meaningful. But I won't be able to finish everything that I have projected. For example, the ones I, uh, uh, the, the, the projects that I took during the end of my life won't be finished. They'll just stop once I die. The ones that we are engaged in at the end of our lives will not be completed. They will be ended. They uh, will be uh, like threads that have been cut before being attached or tied anywhere. What death accomplishes is to cut off whatever projects is uh, projects a person is participating in at the uh, at the time. So, like a relationship, for example, that can never be complete relationships and unless you're a, you're a, a Kierkegaardian asshole who looks at relationships like some aesthetic works of, of art um, you know like for example if you are a womanizer who gets to, who get to relationships and then uh, consciously plan on making the woman fall in love with you only to break up with them uh, and see uh, that as a beautiful work of art huh? like uh, <laughs> uh, that's that's not what, what we're talking about so even if you complete some projects, they're always, they'll always be dependent on bigger projects that are still going. Like doing these videos, for example. I can be satisfied each time I finish a video, but these videos are parts of, uh, of you know, uh, the bigger project of being a YouTuber, which is also part of a bigger project of, you know, living with my passion and sharing it with, with others. So eventually, you'll get to the biggest project that encompasses all other projects, and if that one isn't brought into completion, then all the, the other projects uh, I was involved in will too lose their meaning, since the threads that would connect them to the whole is severed. So, some people may say that this is a problem because we're not dying at the right time, for example. They can be, uh, they can be right, uh, but again, how can you know what's the right time to die? Uh, going on in uh, in that path is just adding more difficulties to our task uh, than it needs. We should just accept the premise uh, that may uh, that may says for the vast majority of us, death accomplishes nothing. It merely stops what we would otherwise have wanted to continue: the projects and engagements of our lives. So this is what we come to regret when we think about death. We don't reg regret pleasure or less pain as Epicurus would, uh, would want us to think. Instead, what we have to regret rather is a stoppage without closure of those engagements, those projects that are largely what a human life consists in. So if you want that same experience of not regretting your life that May talked about at the beginning, you won't get it from seeing your life as a novel. You need to look for it elsewhere. Nothing so far has satisfied the two themes of death. We've seen till this point that death is the end of us and that death negates our engagements. We can even say that Epicurus fails the first theme since, it's, uh, since he solved it by making life about pain and pleasure. But as we've seen, that's not accurate through the demonstration that his philosophy fails at the second uh, at the second theme. So in the end, Epicurus fails both of those themes. We have to we have to summarize why briefly. It's because Epicurus doesn't see death as an evil, whereas 
May doesn't see uh, death as evil either, he still has to consider it as such. So to come to terms with death by depriving it of the evil side is an easy way out. That can only work out if we also deprive ourselves of what makes us human. That is, that we are aware that, you know, uh, we, that we are aware of death and that we are creatures that make engagements. So as we turn to the third theme now, we need to acknowledge that death isn't some good thing that can only be good because it is an absence of pain or because it has no evil within. We need to come to terms with death without removing that it is evil. So we need to see death as something that is evil too. And at this point of the book, May introduces another philosopher who wrote very influ who was very uh, influential and wrote a very influential essay on the topic called On Death, uh, and that is Thomas Nigel, or Nigel, I'm not sure of uh, the pronunciation. So the difference between, uh, I'm just going to call him uh, Nigel, uh, Nigel uh, here, so between Nigel and Epicurus um, is that Nigel doesn't deny that death is an evil to us because as he argues, for death uh, to be non-evil, we have to look at life in its basic form as either evil or neutral. Uh, I mean, if if death is not a non-evil, then it means that you know life is either evil or neutral. This, however, is wrong for Nigel. The fact that I am alive is always better than being dead. If we remove all the experiences of my life and I'm just left with the bare life, like I'm experiencing just being alive, that for Nigel is better than experiencing nothing. As he puts it, there are elements in which, uh, there are elements which, if added to one's experience, make life better. There are elements which, if added to one's life uh, experience, make life worse. But what remains when these are set aside is not merely neutral. It is emphatically positive. The, added, the additional positive weight is supplied by experience itself rather than by any of its contents. So in other words, being alive without yet having any experience is still a pleasure. Life, uh, life on its own in itself is positive. It is neither evil nor neutral. Okay, Life is good. And so, if life itself is positive, then whatever ends it is an evil because it is worse than life. Therefore, death is evil to us. Or as May summarizes it, uh, in the absence of all these projects, there is something about life that is itself a pleasure. There is something about life that makes it worth being there even when one's projects go, uh, go uh, awry. I think that's how you pronounce it. <laughs> so, good examples of this are moments in which you just chill, for example. When you're lying in a field of grass, taking a nap, and you wake up and look at the blue sky, maybe you see bits of sunshine through the leaves uh, of the tree, you know, that covers you with, the, with its shadows, and so you are enjoying the breeze, and you know, th things, things like that are no engagement, but there are reasons to be alive. They're basic stuff that we enjoy, and whatever interrupts them is an evil thing. And the evil thing is indeed evil because not only it interrupts those moments, but it also makes it uh, unavoidable. Like you know, if like you like you know, if death strikes, there is nothing you can do about it, and you can't know uh, when that is going to hit you. So, in other words, you get to the third theme: it is once inevitable and uncertain. So. When you have this knowledge in mind, it can become even more difficult to enjoy those moments. After all, death has already made its joke on us. Why would it strike us when we're enjoying the simplest, peaceful moments of our lives? And so this for me means that death is always with us. It haunts us. It accompanies every moment of our, every moment of our lives. We are never far away from death because it will inevitably happen and we cannot control the moment when it, uh, when it will. And so, as, he, uh, as the saying goes, when you're born, you're always old enough to die. And so, this thought is always with you. Whenever, 
uh, whether you think uh, about it or not, whether you entertain it or not, the thought is with you. Some people can object by saying that the fact that we know that death is in, uh, inevitable and uncertain doesn't mean that we're, uh, that we're acting out on that knowledge. We can still enjoy things without the thought of death running, uh, ruining, uh, ruining it for us. Um, and a stronger objection can even say that most of the time we don't actually think about death. We actually avoid thinking about it, and we do it very, very well. And when we do, in uh, and, when, and and even when when we do in public, someone is going to tell us not to uh, not to think about it because we'll kill the the mood or the vibe. Like gloomy subjects are not the main uh, are not the, ma the main object of most of our conversations or, or thoughts or actions. But May has a response to this which is just because we're not consciously acting out on some belief or knowledge doesn't mean that we're not acting on it. Uh, if there is a field that proves that all, uh, uh, that, that, proves it, that proves it well is psychoanalysis, right? But we don't even need to go that far. What he says is we do not have, we do not have to embrace psychoanalysis or believe in some concepts of the unconscious to realize that people often neglect to face things that are nevertheless influencing how they behave. Like in our psychology, past traumas or insecurities can make us do things that we ourselves don't, don't know why we're doing them. We seek the approval of someone, for example, without the knowledge that's an insecurity created from a series of emotional neglect that we went through when we were kids. And so similarly, we can be acting out in a certain way because of knowing that death is always lurking, even if we're not consciously entertaining the thought in our head as we, uh, as we do whatever it is that we do. And so like past, just like past traumas, we don't like to think about those, but they're still shaping a lot of our behavior and the same goes with death. So it is with death. We know we will die and we know that we don't know when, uh, when we will die. We navigate our lives in the shadow of this dual recognition without always bringing it uh, before ourselves consciously and without always wanting it to, uh, without always wanting, uh, wanting to bring it before ourselves consciously. Our mortality is always at work within us, even when, or perhaps most especially, when we try to avoid it. So avoiding uh, this third theme can be denying one uh, or the other character of the theme. We can deny the uncertainty of death and embrace its inevitability. This is when we have people who are provoking death, you know, going, uh, doing dangerous stunts, for example. These people uh, may, uh, may has a fun way to explain their behavior because they're uncertain of how they will die. Death will happen to them, but on their own terms, you know. Uh, or you can do the opposite, like you can acknowledge its uncertainty, but deny its in inevitability. Uh, this results in always making plans for the future and never getting a chance to live in the present. Uh, like all of these behaviors count for the unconscious drive of controlling our lives on our own terms. We try to beat death at its own game. If I cannot escape and cannot know when it hits, then I'll be the one who will decide of my own death. Like it's, it's like suicide when, uh, where, uh, where you feel that now you are the one in charge, you're the one in control of your life and also of your death. And so this is also when people uh, write wills or take, you know, life insurances, for example, in, in May's words. Uh, although we don't control our death in this way, we seek to control its effects on people we love. You know, this is when, when, when you take, you know, life insurance or uh, write a will. So the same also goes with dwelling on death. Uh, whomever is trying to understand death by thinking about it is also trying to control it. And whomever tries to control death is denying death. If I am constantly thinking about death, then death cannot catch me by surprise, right? Like all of these schemes are like you trying to give death the satisfaction. Uh, you, you, you don't want to give death the, the satisfaction of winning. Like when you are in a fight and you know you're going to lose. So at least you try to take away the taste of victory from your opponent. So when you know that someone is going to kill you and you can't do anything about it, the best way to get back at them is to kill yourself. <laughs> so 
So, so however, all of these attempts about trying to take away the taste of victory, it may work on another guy trying to murder you, but it won't work on death. If you want to beat death, you'll have to make it not the reason for your death or the reason of your actions. But that seems impossible. Denying death is also uh, death's way of sneaking up on you. You know, like Oedipus, who... Uh, uh, however, you use your intellect, your intellect is going to fuck you up. You know, there is no, there is no running away from death. So here, uh, May returns to Heidegger, who has argued that, the, that we always live in the denial of death. What he means is that we don't sufficiently come to terms with the fact of our death, with its finality, its goallessness, its inevitability, and its uncertainty. So, trying to end our novel on a meaningful note is also a way of denying either the uncertainty or the inevitability of death, or both. It's a way of trying to either leave something behind, some sort of legacy, that will transcend your death. One of the strategies that people uh, adopt to cheat death is to make sure uh, that they left a trace somewhere or that they led a moral life. Some people try to find meaning, for example, in being involved with social causes or try to do their best to help others. Quote, it is not in relation to itself that life has its importance, but rather in its contribution to the world and specifically to others who inhabit that, uh, that world. Or maybe people would try to die on your own, uh, on your own terms, beyond the uncertainty of death. To do all of these things is trying to argue that death doesn't structure my life, I'm the one who is structuring it. But none of it matters because as much as you try, it is death, it is not you who structure your life. You can never obtain that privilege since to be able to structure one's life is to have the ability to be outside of one's life. If you dedicate your life for saving others, for example, at the end, they'll die too. Death can make all of your efforts pointless. As he says, if death uh, makes life as contingent and pointless, then my desire to contribute to other lives ultimately is ultimately in vain. The lives of others are no more meaningful than my own. You know, and so if my life is meaningless, how can I make the life of others meaningful? So in other words, it's like a character from a novel who tries to become the author. People who deny death are kind of like that. They, are, they try to make their lives into a novel, into a piece of artwork in which every single experience would fit in like, you know, a perfect puzzle and we've seen that, uh, that that's impossible to do. If we have to be the artists or novelists, we have to be ones that are content with an unfinished work. We, uh, quote from, from May, we have seen that death does not bring together the threads of one's life, it merely cuts them, the best one can hope. Uh, the best, uh, the best one can hope for from uh, most lives would be the uh, creation of an unfinished work of art. So again, May is not saying that leaving a legacy or spending your life caring about others is worthless. On the contrary, those things are meaningful. For a reminder, he is pointing out that death can make us lose sight of that meaningfulness. Uh, of those activities and that uh, and that fear can make us either not appreciate what we are doing like you know helping others or producing art but what may is trying to do is give us a way in which we can experience those things to their fullest in a way that is compatible with our awareness of death just because you know we die doesn't mean that we uh, doesn't mean that what we do is meaningless as he says my goal here is not to say that death eliminates the very possibility of our lives, uh, our lives having meaning, rather it is to point to why death seems to lend an aura of meaninglessness of our life, to our lives. So his goal is rather to make us come to terms with the fact that death is, you know, the end of everything important about us and yet we can still have meaning. Death, as he says, makes our actions seem like sharing a meal with a fellow passenger on a sinking ship. So the challenge is that despite that, we won't regret our lives. We need to have that more some way or another, right? Uh, otherwise, whatever it is that we do will never be enough. 
So again, trying to make your life meaningful through helping others isn't enough because for most of us, we still want our lives to have meaning in themselves. They have to, uh, since the point of going out of our way to help others also stems from a desire to be the authors of our destiny. It wouldn't make sense to replace death by other people, you know? So if my life has meaning only through the help I can give to others, then I'm still not the author of my destiny. I am still relying on some other entity to confer that meaning. Quote, it is difficult to take one's life uh, meaning solely through the flourishing of others. We want to feel as though our lives had meaning in some sense on their own terms. So an artistic life is first of all about me. And that's, you know, its appeal. I can turn my altruism into an art, but then it will lose its moral and ethical point, which is also needed for its meaning. So when people, uh, when helping others, I can't become an artist here because I'll be, I'll be then deciding on what the other needs. If uh, you want to help others, I think the other is the one who should be in charge about what they need from you. And so using their needs for your own uh, existential novel can come as very, uh, as very selfish, unethical, inconsiderate, and hurtful. Now, of course, some people ask for help, but they never give the terms of their needs and then blame you for not helping them in the way that they wanted. But in that case, you're not using you know, their needs for your novel, but rather going, uh, uh, going with whatever you, uh, you can know about their needs. So anyways, to go back to May, and our subject matter, he says that we need to know what uh, that our lives have meaning on their own and that they are not reducible to our contribution to someone else's lives or needs. We deserve to exist outside of our relationships. But as we've seen, to be an artist about one's life isn't satisfying either. We cannot be satisfied both as being involved with others or with only ourselves. Turn the problem all you want, in the end, death always wins. And so with this we get to the fourth theme of death, which is that death is final. It is stoppage without goal or whole uh, or wholeness. It is inescapable and yet incalculable. It is not itself meaningless, but it can make us feel ourselves to be meaningless. And so this is the dilemma we're confronted to earlier. It structures our lives, therefore it makes them meaningful, but at the same time, because of the three other themes we've, uh, we've seen, it takes away that meaningfulness. And so to return to Heidegger, this is what he calls the angst when you face death. Death has an anxiety that stems from it, and that's what we, uh, we run away, that's what we flee from. The anxiety when we get to the thought of our inexistence, the possibility of our impossibility, as it is often uh, framed. And so to summarize them uh, quickly, first, so the four themes, first, death is the end of us, nothing remains of us after we die, we are only, uh, sorry, we are uh, only the lives we lead now, those, uh, those lives have no point other than themselves, they lead to nothing else, no reward, no punishment, all roads lead to our own annihilation. Moreover, this is the, the second theme, death itself lends no meaning to those lives. In death, the, th the threads that have uh, tied us to the world are, no are not knotted together or woven into some greater fabric, they are simply cut, left to lie, there with no pattern or connection. Thirdly, this death that cuts those threads could happen at any time. There is no justice when it, ha uh, when it happens, although it happens, uh, although happen it will. Uh, we, live, uh, we live always in the recognition, if not the reflective awareness, that our lives will uh, someday come to a uh, cessation without closure and without appeal. And that day, and that day could, uh, could be any day, some days may be less likely than others, but any day would do. And so as we have seen, these themes lead to our lives being meaningless and no amount of pleasure and fun would get through them. It won't be enough. So as May says, we want more than just enjoy our lives. We want them to be meaningful. 
So one of the ways people have tried to deal with, uh, with death is through religion. Um, if, as we've seen, the problem with death is that it cuts my project short and that makes, uh, makes us afraid of it, uh, people have invented ways to uh, circumvent that problem. They made religion, which is basically a desire to survive death. By this we mean that there is something that doesn't get severed with death, something that survives it. That something is whatever makes me me. So, in other words, what survives my death is me. In other words, religions, religious conceptions of death is, you know, uh, they're different from real death. In religion, does that, uh, death does not kill, uh, does not kill you. I mean, it does kill almost everything about you except you. So when you die in religion, you don't really die. There is an afterlife that awaits you. The way religion offers, this way uh, religion offers at least one project that lasts beyond your death. And needless to say that religion makes that project, the one about uh, preparing yourself to meet your maker, the most important fact about you, you know, and the most important of all of your projects. So in religion, as saying that there is an afterlife, you don't die, you survive annihilation. So here we can say that we are dealing with a way to confer meaning. Well, not everyone agrees with that. Like Nietzsche, for example, thinks that if the price for meaningfulness is to just deny this world for a speculative higher one, we might as well become nihilist since, uh, since religion is nihilist for, uh, for Nietzsche. It uh, wants to give us meaning, but denigrating the thing that can actually give meaning okay you cannot you can you, can, you cannot be more my uh, more nihilistic than that but still as may says following nietzsche uh having the possibility of an afterlife uh, can do the trick however afterlives don't only diminish temporary tem temporal lives they also lend uh, lend them significance they offer lives the possibility of being successes and failures which in turn allows these lives to make sense of those who live, uh, who live them. And of course, in order for this to work, it needs a specific condition, which is whatever survives death has to be you. It is what survives, uh, survives death. The you that exists after you die is, in some sense, the same you that existed during your life. It has to be. Uh, it has to be you, because if it isn't you who goes to the afterlife, then it's completely meaningless. Why would I be doing all of these sacrifices and moral actions if at the end someone else is going to get the reward? And it wouldn't be fair either if someone else gets punished and sentenced to hell for the things that I did, right? So, whatever, uh, whether you, uh, you get to heaven or hell, that someone who gets to be judged at the afterlife has to be the same person who lived your who who lived as you before you died so this is the standard narrative in monotheistic religions of judaism christianity and islam your soul which is the you we're talking about here survives its death and gets judged this means that there has to be a continuity between what May calls the three stages of your existence. The first stage is your existence here on this earth, your life uh, in the mundane sense. The second is your existence after you die, but before you get judged. And the third is your existence after you are judged. These three stages must all be stages of your existence. It must be you at every point in this process. So of course, this leads a lot. Uh, this leads to a lot of problems. Uh, I mean, if I'm, uh, if what is going to survive my death is my essence, and what is going to survive your death is your essence, well, we have to know what that essence is. What is clear is that you don't take your body with you in your afterlife, so the body cannot be your essence. But then your essence must carry something from this world, from the first and the second stage, if it is to be judged. 
like you have to carry some of your memories at least you need to have some intellectual uh, continuity between the person you you are now and the one you were during your life you also need to be the same personality you need to have the same emotion emotional responses uh, responses if you're going to be judged so that happens uh, that opens, sorry, that opens a lot of problems that don't seem to have a coherent answer, honestly. That your soul must keep something of your memories, your emotional personality and intellect without a body seems a bit counterintuitive and just seems like it is stemming from a desire to transcend death, to keep projecting ourselves like we used to do in, uh, like we used to do in this life, to keep experiencing stuff and more importantly, experience ourselves and be aware that we are still existing and so the same pattern can be seen in eastern religions as well as such in uh, such as in uh, buddhism and hinduism like in monotheistic religions uh, eastern religions also advocates for something that survives after your death and that something has to be you, your core, your essence, and like in monotheistic religions, there is a distinction between the things that matter and those that don't. What determines those is based on whether or not you will, uh, whether or not they'll survive death or not. If they vanish with death, then they don't matter. If they survive, then they do. Things like fame, wealth, reputation, pleasure, etc. don't survive death. You take none of that with you after, after you die. Some in some religions, like uh, the ancient uh, Egyptian uh, religion, uh, well, they say that, yes, you can take uh, your property with you when you die, but it has uh, the same kind of thinking, that those, uh, that, those th that property belongs to you, and so they are part of you, but they'll maintain a distinction nonetheless between what is important and what is not. So hence the emphasis in Buddhism to be detached from material uh, from the material world because you cannot take anything from the world with uh, with you once you die. And since what makes us attached to the vanity of the material world is desire, then Buddhists need to train themselves to reject or resist desire. Moreover, desire is at the roots of all evil and suffering. According to a Buddhist, when people desire things, not only they attach themselves to things that do not matter and won't give them any meaningful satisfaction to their desires, but it can also easily turn people against each other as they're now competing for the objects of their desires. And so in the end, because of desire, we cause our own suffering and we hurt each other for things that do not matter. Quote, desire leads not only to our suffering, but to the suffering of others as well. It is through desire that we compete with others, that we that we want what they have, that we compare ourselves to them, and ultimately that we are willing to harm them. Without desire, one would have no reason to treat others badly. So this is where, as May explains, the concept of karma steps in. Karma can be seen in two ways. Um, there is a less popular way to interpret karma, a way that doesn't necessarily involve death, which is, you know, the uh, which is karma within your own uh, your own life. Uh, as may explain this, um, uh, this this way looks at desire like an unending carousel. This is the wheel of samsara, samsara that keeps spinning as you move from uh, from one desire to uh, to the next. Uh, the Buddhist wheel of samsara refers to the unending slacking and return of desire. One desires uh, has that desire uh, met or not met, and then moves on to the next desire, always unsatisfied. This is more akin to the Schop uh, Schopenhauerian. Uh, interpretation of desire, that desire is like a pendulum that uh, swings from suffering to boredom. Uh, when we desire something, we suffer, and once we get it, we get bored of it. And so another desire comes in and repeats uh, the cycle, etc., etc. And so, as you indulge in, uh, as you indulge in uh, in satisfying one desire, your karma is going to bring you another desire uh, once you're done with the previous one. So when you follow desire, the law of karma is going to apply, and so you find another desire on your lap, etc., etc. It's, it's never, it's never ending. It's a never-ending cycle of suffering. So this doesn't have to include any notion of an afterlife uh, or of, of death. But the more popular version of karma does concern the afterlife because it's about reincarnation. 
All right. He says, the wheel of samsara, samsara refers to cycles of life and rebirth that one undergoes until one achieves nirvana, that is, an existence void of desire. So here the logic of karma begins with, uh, uh, with, with the reappearing, uh, with the repeating pattern of desire after desire after desire, it gets a more cosmic dimension. Now, it is not just about individual actions, but about an entire life. Like if you spend your whole life running from desire to, uh, from one desire to the next, you get reincarnated again in a lower state of existence in which, you know, desire is harder to resist. On the other hand, if you resist desire, you get to be reborn in a higher form of existence in which resisting desire is easier. And as you keep practicing virtue, eventually your karma will get you to the point where there is no reincarnation anymore. You stepped out of the wheel of, the, of, of samsara and that's what Buddhists call nirvana. So one's karma is both the sum of uh, some, some total of a particular life and the grade that life has earned on a scale of eliminating desire and its effects. Thus one's karma situates one relative to the next life. And so this is where we have the uh, similarities between Eastern and monotheistic religions. In order for you to be reborn, something of you must survive your death, your core or your essence doesn't die. And like in Christianity, it wouldn't make sense that what is going to be reborn isn't you, right? If, uh, I mean, it, it, it cannot be fair if it is someone, someone else who gets reborn in a lower state in, the, in your place or gets the higher stay, uh, stay, uh, state uh, uh, in your place. It has to be you. So as May says, in Christianity, Judaism, Islam, you have only one temporal life. The judgment of your soul happens once, but in Buddhism, as in Hinduism, each life is judged, depositing you in the next life in a form that matches the karma of your previous life. And so, although there are fundamental differences between the two approaches, in mono monotheistic religion, your life is just a test for an eternal reward or damnation, whereas in Buddhism, a desire is something to be mastered and overcome, so hence, the former is more linear, while the other is cyclical and perhaps more uh, reassuring, because at least you always get a chance to reach Nirvana. In monotheism, you don't get eternal chances. Once you die, the, the, the test, the test is, uh, is over. But approaches uh, do have, uh, both approaches do have this thing in common, which is they both uh, postulate that something fundamental about you survives your death and that uh, thing is you, it is your self. Now, to be fair, this idea of a self is ambivalent in Buddhism because Buddhists often claim that the self is an illusion and that the self doesn't really exist and you can dissipate that illusion once you reach Nirvana, but it's still a contradiction or at least a paradox within Buddhism. If you're going to be reincarnated, there has to be a self that even if it is an illusion, it is treated as a real Thing by the cosmic laws of, of karma. So it has to be treated as something that is consistent and coherent and has continu uh, continuity, otherwise the incarnation process becomes arbitrary and random, and Buddhists insist that it is not, that karma is always fair and ordered, even if uh, the only consistency and continuity of that self is its evolution, uh, that it is, you know, constantly changing, the changing it's uh, the changing itself must be consistent consistent sorry. so of course there's the issue of what happens when you get to nirvana i mean do i still die do do you become immortal but those questions aren't much of a concern for us here because the point is that death is not the end of you that's all we are concerned with and even if it is the end of you when you get to nirvana you still have to survive a lot of deaths before you reach it so the essential point is that both eastern and monotheistic religions uh, and most religions that exist that existed have this thing in common death is ultimately something that is avoided it is not just uh, that it can be avoided it is essentially avoid it. If we can put it this way, it is unavoidably avoided. Whatever happens to your body or your bodies continue, you continue to exist. So death isn't really a thing for, relig for religions, 
but may being an atheist like myself can't can we cannot seek refuge in such you know uh, worldviews we here have to wrestle with the fact that when death strikes there is nothing to survive it that death is really the end of you and may even suspect that's how most people think about death because that's a very unsettling thought to think that we won't exist anymore and that poses an enormous existential threat to everything we've been doing in our lives to our projects to the things that mean so much to us like you know the students may uh, may have to write their most important things in the in a piece of paper before tearing to shreds because we know that fact that we are going to die we come up with fantasies in which we would survive that uh, that death and so May says that most of us fear death because we know deep down that there is no afterlife, or at least we doubt that it. Uh, we doubt it all the time, and the people who are so confident in the afterlife that they never doubt that death can be the actual end. Well, May says that this means that death eludes no anxi uh, anxiety to them. They just care about scoring points for the afterlife, which of course are just you know a very this is a very small minority. Most of us, whether we believe or not in an afterlife, are never confident enough in our belief that it surpasses the doubts and anxiety that come with, uh, with death. As May writes, I suspect that most religious people are not certain of their faith, that it would be pointless to ask about death as though there, was no, there were no afterlife. Faith struggles with doubt, giving death an opening. Belief can push against death, but doubt always uh, allows death to push back. So what are we supposed to do then when we are facing death in the way that May portrays? That death is the end of us. So what, what do we do? Well, May tells us that there, that there, would, that there would only be two cures for the central role of, uh, of death and the anguish it provokes. We already mentioned the first one, we just become unaware of our death, like we don't, we don't cure death, we just cure our cognition about death, but as we've seen, uh, if we go down that path, we need to regress to something that is less of a human being, and the other cure is, as he says, would be a cure for death itself. If we were immortal, if we did not die then everything about uh, death that haunts uh, that haunts our life would immediately disappear however may isn't so sure while he argues that more immortality could cure death he asks would it give our lives meaning and this is what we will uh, we will see in the next uh, video and